you know. Well, I'm delighted for Dorothy Bunting Montgomery and Debbie Bilstein to be presenting this evening for this installment of the Grantwood Country Forum. So please tell us all about it. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. I just want to do a check that you can see the screen. Yes. You see, excellent. Yes. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to really kind of launch this, but Debbie Beilstein is going to take the majority of tonight's conversation. Um, when Elaine was looking for topics for this, um, I recommended Portrait of Nan because it's one of my favorite Grant Wood paintings. And I think you can see too, the colors It's just a really vivid painting. But um, Nan helped me really find this forum and, and find my relationship, I would say, with many of you. And um, I started to write a book um, back in the early 2000s, and um, it was really a tribute to Nan. It was called Stone Fruit, and the story was about mainly a tribute to Nan because Nan Wood Graham died on my 30th birthday. And I always thought that was kind of an interesting fact, and that's December 14th, and she died in the year 1990. So that really got me to start to um, think about the story and to really honor her. Well, in writing that story, I was privileged enough to meet Debbie Beilstein. And I live in California, so does Debbie. We probably live about an hour and a half um, by travel from each other. Um, it'd be much sooner if it wasn't for LA traffic. But, um, but I had a chance to meet her and it was an awesome meeting because she shared so many things that she's gonna share with you tonight. And it was interesting to see someone like Debbie who had grown up in California, but had all this animosa, Iowa, Jones County, Eastern Iowa, um, just objects, things that I think many of you will recognize tonight. And as many of you know, who've gotten to know Debbie, she is such a, she's not only the closest family member we have to Nan, but she's also a sweetheart in sharing everything about Nan and the family with all of us. So tonight is really for Debbie, and it's really about her relationship with Nan, even though we'll give you some background about the painting, um, we're going to talk about Debbie's special um, relationship with Nan. So without further ado, Debbie, I'm going to pass it over to you. Okay, thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Elaine, and also Cedar Rapids uh, Public Library. So some of you that know me know uh, my relationship with the Wood family, so I will uh, definitely talk about that tonight uh, from my script, of course. So you'll have to bear with me. Nan was a special person to me. So as I am right now, I might get a little choked up with this, some of these memories. So before I begin, I'd like to make some acknowledgements to family and friends for photographs and stories. These people include Cheryl Petrovich, Dottie Visker, Wanda Korn, Mardina Carpenter, John and Sharon Ball, Paul and Barbara Beilstein, Howard and Patricia Beilstein, Frank and Clara Wood, and of course, Nan Wood Graham. My contribution to today's presentation is a bit unique in that I actually knew Nan Wood Graham from the age of three into my 30s when she passed away. My memories of her are many, so my goal is to give a bit of a personal portrait of Nan as viewed by someone who loved her. Next slide. Portrait of Nan was the apology portrait, a gift from her brother for all the slings and arrows she took for American Gothic. She oft repeated the quotation that someone said she had a face that could sour milk. She said it to me and she said it in interviews. She acknowledged in an article she wrote for Cornet Magazine in June, 1945. I was kidded so much about it that he thought I might be hurt. So he decided to paint a portrait of me. It makes me very humble to think that of all the paintings Grant ever did, my portrait was the only painting he had in his home. How much love he must have had for his sister. I guess this was his way, a way for him to keep her close always. As of the day, as of this date in March, 2022, the painting is up for sale for eight figures. In an article about Portrait of Nan, art dealer Buck Kishel says, this painting has a strong energy coming from it. I know that makes me sound crazy, but it's there. Nan sold the 
painting to the Encyclopedia Britannica, and it was bought by Senator William Benton of Connecticut, who was an executive of that firm. In 1981, while appearing on the television show To Tell the Truth, her second appearance in 10 years as the American Gothic model, the host mentioned to Nan that her brother had also painted her portrait. On the television program, she mentioned Encyclopedia Britannica and she said the man died. She didn't know what happened to it after that and was actually asking where it was because she would love to know. I hope someone got in touch with her after the show. And on this slide, of course, and I don't know, uh, Dorothy, you wanted to mention any of the other details about the history of the painting on here? Yeah, you can see it was in the L.V. High Museum of Art at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for many years. And in fact, when I was doing the research on my book, it had just been sold. The family had sold it because it was actually um, Senator William Benton's wife. Um, she was originally from Wisconsin. And so this painting went home to a museum in the Madison area. And as Debbie said, um, it has just escalated in value. And we're gonna share just a lot of tidbits about this painting throughout tonight's presentation, but also feel free to ask questions in chat. Feel free to definitely ask us questions too at the end of tonight's presentation. Next slide. So <clears throat> what did Nan look like when her brother used her as a model? The center oval is a photograph taken of Nan in August, 1930. The same year Grant Wood painted American Gothic. This photo, photograph was in a set of photos once owned by Nan's brother and sister-in-law, Frank and Clara Wood. I was given the photo by my aunt, Barbara Beilstein, who got them from Frank. On the back in Nan's handwriting, and you mind you, she was, what, 31 years old at the time, she wrote, I'm not this fat, ha ha. <laughs> Notice the hair. The style is almost exactly the same except shorter in Portrait of Nan. Next slide. So how do I know Nan Wood Graham and how was she related to my family? Well, I have to give full credit to my grandmother's older sister, Clara Agnes Peck. Grant's oldest brother, Frank, was in the automobile industry. He and his grandpa Weaver had the first automobile dealership in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. In 1910 or 1911, Frank was delivering a car to a Mr. Hibbs in Marengo, Iowa. Clara happened to see Frank driving through town and said, that's the man I want to marry. Frank missed his train going back to Cedar Rapids after delivering the car and was invited to see the town and go to a dance by Mr. Hibbs. Frank was introduced to Clara at the dance and in Frank's words, it was a case of mutual admiration. Frank left for Cedar Rapids the next day and promised to return. Their courtship was about six months and Frank and Clara married on her 25th birthday, April 19, 1911. This photograph shows the family celebrating Frank and Clara Wood's 65th wedding anniversary in 1976. I can name everyone in the photograph, but for the sake of time, I will point out myself, the nerdy one on the left, <laughs> Nan Wood Graham, Frank M. Wood, and Clara Peck Wood. Nan was my great aunt's sister-in-law and my great uncle's sister. The Woods are not blood relatives, but married into the family. Next slide. But Debbie, I think what's oh. really interesting is that you also have a, a Marengo, Iowa, a Cedar Rapids connection. Um, talk a little bit about your dad and some of the last names that you're connected to. Like we see the name Peck. That's definitely a Cedar Rapids based last name. Well, uh, Clara Peck, who married Frank Wood, her father, um, Otto Peck, Peck, had a bunch of kids. So I you know, I'm sure that there were different ones that, um, you know, married and went their different directions. And then father, the man in the middle behind Clara, on his grandmother's side, 
his, I, I think it would be his great, great grandfather, his, no, it would be his great grandfather was J John Nash was a Civil War veteran. And I was going to talk a little bit about him later, but, but when I do ancestry and get all the DNA matches with everybody, there are so many people named Nash and a lot still in, in Iowa. Definitely. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. Next slide. So Iowa is in our blood, however. American Gothic Grant Wood and Nan Wood Graham are in our blood, so much so that my mom wanted to be Nan. My sister wanted to be Nan. My sister-in-law wanted to be Nan. Next slide. My niece wanted to be Nan. Another niece wanted to be Nan. My cousin wanted to be Nan. Another cousin wanted to be Nan. Next slide. you like this one. I wanted to be Nan. Even Nan wanted to be Nan. Frank Wood, eldest brother of Grant, John and Nan, was in the automobile industry. His last position before he retired was with Standard Battery and Electric in Waterloo, Iowa. He and Clara were members of St. Edward's Parish in Waterloo. And if you're lucky enough, you may have stumbled upon the cookbook, Cooking in the Land of Corn, featuring artwork and recipes of Grant and a foreword by Nan Wood Graham. Now, oh, go back, Dorothy. I was just going to say, yeah, this is good. So one little tidbit of information. I was three years old. or And this picture was November 1960, almost three. And I do remember this. We were in their backyard. And I got on all fours. I was either a dog or a horse. And I instructed Frank to do the same. So my mother happened to have the camera and caught us being horses or dogs in the backyard. So Frank was essentially the grandpa I never had. So he had a nickname for me, Dibby Dabby Debbie. And I in turn said to him, Hanky Panky Frankie. Anyway. That's not about Nan, really, but okay, next slide. At the request of Clara's widowed sister, Leona Bilestein, living in San Diego, California, who was a transplant from Marengo, Clara and Frank were asked if they would like to live their retirement years in San Diego. There was only one stipulation made by Frank, and that was that he could work on the house. Frank was quite the carpenter and handyman, but that's a story for another day. Next slide. How many people can say they have a first meeting with someone memorialized on film? We were so lucky that my parents had their eight millimeter camera ready for special occasions. No doubt Nanwood Graham and her husband, Ed, were visiting Frank, Clara, and my grandmother for the holidays. They came over to our house on Christmas Eve when we opened presents and my dad was bartender for the evening. I want you to notice Nan's hair color in this clip. It sure matches portrait of Nan. Nan was 61 in this. Her brother Frank would soon be 74, and I would soon be three. So Debbie, before I show this video, is there a lot of video on Nan out on the internet that you're aware of? Um, I kind of looked through our home. I, I don't think there is a lot of her, you know, post or aside from family stuff. I, this is like the longest clip I've got. She also attended um, my sister's wedding. So I have a, you know, she's kind of in the background and everything, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's, you know, archive. Well, you know, she's been on television before, so there's probably something out there. She also was on t two episodes of To Tell the Truth, which I have copies of, but because of um, copyright and licensing and all that good stuff, I'm not, I'm not allowed to publish them. I'd have to get some kind of attorney to get all the fees taken care of, all of that stuff. So, but this well, is, 
If um, I can interrupt, yeah. um, when I worked at the History Center, I came across a movie, what do you call it, like 30 millimeter, you know, 30 millimeter movie or whatever it is they used to use. And um, it was in terrible shape, but it was an interview of Nan at wow. Five Turner Alley. Oh, wow. And um, I tried to get it uh, kind of resurrected or restored. It would have been extremely expensive. And to tell you the truth, I do not know what happened with it. Oh, wow. Um, but I do know that I gave it over to uh, the Co College Library because they had somebody who knew about this, but he is retired from there and I have retired. And so um, I've lost track, but I can check that out. It was really interesting. Really interesting. Well, you would think that I know these eight millimeter home movies i took to a vendor who specialized in transferring your home it was called legacy they transfer your your home movies your video so I, um, um i don't know if you're breaking up for other people but i um, yeah. You are breaking up for me, but at any rate, yeah. I do know about that, but we had to restore the movie itself before we could transfer it to anything else, but you're right. I'll have to check with this gentleman. I know who it is, and we'll see what he's done. I'll make a note of that and get back to you. Thanks. Thanks, Barbara. So, Debbie, before I roll this video, do you want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in this picture in front of us? Okay. So you'll see very quickly from left to right, you'll see Clara Wood sitting by herself on a couch. Then my grandmother, Clara's sister, Nan, and Nan and my grandmother seem to be enjoying themselves very much. You'll see my brother in the background in the pile of presents. You'll see Ed Graham, Nan's husband. You'll see Frank and everybody seems to have a cocktail in their hand. And then you'll see my sister and me on the floor playing color forms. And then kind of the end of the little clip that, you know, there's more on it, but not relevant. Um, you'll see my dad toasting the camera, so. And then right in front of you, this is Debbie. Um, this is a pinata, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is actually part of the whole YouTube. I'm hit, my birthday is Christmas day. So we always had a Santa Claus pinata, and that's me, uh, the little blonde kid in the front there going to bat the pinata. So, but that's it. We won't be seeing that tonight. If you want to check it out on YouTube, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay. So there's Clara on the left, and Leona, my grandmother, and Nan. Look at her hair. Isn't that like the same color? My brother, that's Ed, that's Nan's husband. There's Frank. That's my sister. <laughs> and there, there's yours truly. And, that, and then um, just another quick pan. But that is the first time I met there's my dad. That is the first time I met Nan Wood Graham and Ed. I had already met Frank and Clara. Okay. What, and this, this says a lot about who Nan was. What book or cookbook didn't we have that featured Grant Wood and his art? What figurine or plate didn't we have that wasn't American Gothic or Grant Wood related? Nan had her favorite people to give gifts to. She was an extremely generous woman. For me, there were some very special items. She gave me a miniature American Gothic with a plastic frame where she wrote, To Debbie, Love Nan. From her frequent trips to Iowa to attend festivals, Nan gave me a wooden nickel and a doll created to look like woman with plants. Perhaps the best gift Nan gave me was a scrapbook she put together in the 1930s. 
It had her personal recollections and thoughts about celebrities she saw mostly in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She knew I liked old movies and so she thought I would like to have it. My mother had the wherewithal to ask to have Nan write her name in the book as the person who put it together. Of course, Nan obliged. What's interesting is that this was right after she posed for her brother. I'll read one of the pages the one she described as my biggest thrill. Next slide. And Debbie, before we head to the oh, next slide, okay. no worries. I just want to, for those of you who are from the Jones County, Lynn County area, you might remember in the early 1970s, there were a lot of centennials. A lot of towns in Jones County, Lynn County were going through their centennials and you would see a lot of dolls like this. So Debbie and I were talking about if this doll was maybe made by one of the, some of the local women, which at the time, a lot of the local women did that. Um, and Debbie, you want to talk about the shoe? Oh, <laughs> so I guess, what was I, 14 years old, 13, 14. And I, so Nan actually had two dolls and the one she kept, and then mine was nearly identical except mine had mismatched shoes. They're not the same. And I kind of was like, oh, well, uh, I kind of wanted the one Nan had because the shoes were matching. So it just, just kind of a young teenager's thought process. But I, I remember, so now when I look at those shoes, I think, oh yeah, I remember when I wanted Nan's doll because her doll had the perfect matching shoes, so. So when I first met Debbie, she had this shoe box of all these wonderful collections of things she'd gotten from Nan. And it was so awesome to be sitting in California, opening a shoe box, I think, well, Debbie, 2019-ish, and um, seeing something from Anamosa in your shoe box from a gal who grew up in California to say, I remember those dolls. And I remember that art festival, that's the little logo or the little stamp on that dress. And just how awesome it was to see something from so far away um, show up in California in your shoebox. That, that meant a lot to me. The other thing I asked her, if you notice on the list, this is Grant Wood Country. See the kind of the, the sticker that has American Gothic that was in the book. And um, I also asked her if she had more of those, but they were already in the book. I, I don't think she got a stack of them, you know, to pass out. So, now you know where we got the name Grant Wood um, Country Writers Forum. It's been okay. with us for a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here, this is a page out of the scrapbook. And on the left, you can see up at the upper left corner, made by Nan Wood Graham in ballpoint pen, because she obviously used in the 30s some kind of ink pen. And this was put together 1933-1934. So I'm going to read what she wrote, My Biggest Thrill. Our visit to the Edward Robinson home. Mr. Robinson, this is Edward G. Robinson, by the way, the actor. Mr. Robinson was in England making a movie. Mrs. Robinson met us at the door. She wore pajamas and is nice looking. She showed us Grant's painting in the library and then showed us the rest of their collection of paintings worth a fortune. Grant's painting seemed to be their favorite. Then we went back to the library and had a nice visit. Jeannie Robinson, the daughter, came in later. We liked her so much. She said Ed reminded her of her algebra teacher. She said she was quite thrilled to meet me, and Mrs. Robinson said I was a celebrity because I was American Gothic. Mrs. Robinson asked us our choice of drinks and served us cheese sandwiches. Later, the chef came in wearing a great tall chef's hat. She served bacon and tomato sandwiches. Mrs. Robinson showed us Mr. Robinson's mother's picture. She was very lovely to us in more ways than one. I sent her the cup and brooch that Grant used in DAR and she seemed to like them. When we got home, I found I had carried off one of their napkins. So, and I know in one of our presentations, um, Terry Van Dorsten mentioned the brooch being at, at the Figgy Museum, but I'm not sure if it's the same brooch. I know that they have the 
brooch from American Gothic and Woman with Plants, but this, this brooch is a little different. So it would be wonderful to know what ultimately happened to the teacup and the brooch from, from Daughters of Revolution. Next, next slide. Hey, Debbie. Yeah. I know one of our forum enthusiasts is feeling particularly driven to tr track down that teacup. Okay. Oh, I am so glad. Well, uh, and I, so will, <laughs> I will say that, so I know that Edward G. Robinson and that, and that the wife at that time ultimately divorced. I also know that that painting was bought at one time by the ship, Greek shipping magnet Stavros Niarchos. But then I read somewhere that he didn't like, he didn't like um, the American painting so much. So somehow it ended up, where did you say, Cincinnati Art, yes. mu art Museum? Mm -hmm. Anyway, but who knows, maybe the daughter Jeannie got the brooch in the cup. I don't know. Well, I, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure. Uh, the, the person who's interested in that, I don't think is on the session tonight, but I will be sure to let her know she has to listen to this carefully. I, I do see, I, I didn't open it up. I do see a couple of comments coming in on the chat, but maybe we can handle those at the end. Um, any questions and comments? So, all right. So Nan's humor. Perhaps people thought she was as stoic as the daughter in American Gothic or uptight since she famously sued big names because of their tasteless parodies. Nan had a great sense of humor and she loved parodies. She actually collected them and proudly displayed them on her bedroom wall. Her neighbor, Mardina Carpenter in Riverside took a photo of Nan's bedroom wall. Nan's laugh was a chuckle, not with a big outrageous guffaw. Her brother Frank was the same. He had a quiet chuckle and a very dry sense of humor. Maybe that's an Iowa thing. But you can see, um, oh, I will point out in this picture now, that's Mardina's son, Paul. And if you look at the dresser, I know it's kind of, it's not the best quality, but on the dresser, there's a little figurine, Nan's doll with the matching shoes. The one that duplicated the one I had. So do you know what happened to that doll, Debbie, by any chance? I think most of, I think when Nan moved, um, her friends, uh, uh, Pauline Cogswell and Martha Rosen, I believe, helped her move and moved a lot of items with her uh, to Northern California, to Menlo Park. So it could be with some items that Cheryl, uh, Pauline's granddaughter has, I, I don't know. Could be. Next slide. Nan spent many holidays with our family. Her contribution is what we called American Gothic cheese bread, but in cookbooks, she called it American Gothic cheese loaf. You can find the recipe in the American Gothic cookbook compiled by Joan Lufrig Zug of Penfield Books. Nan would bring two loaves piping hot, wrapped in foil on a press board silver tray. It was tradition. We still make the cheese bread, at least my brother does. The mantle was passed. If you like lots of cheese, it's great. That's my brother. And he makes it. And the photograph to the left is probably within the last couple of years. We, we have it every year. So Elaine, where'd you get that cookbook? Oh, I see that. That probably has it in there. You're, you're, you're on mute. <laughs> You're muted. Yes. <laughs> She's explaining it, but that is the cookbook I got it from. You were Sorry, muted. I was, 
I'm sorry, I was on mute. I did I did order it online and it has wonderful information in it. As you know, Debbie, mm -hmm. it, it just, it's more than a cookbook actually, even though it's, it's kind of little, <clears throat> but it's at, <clears throat> what, page me. 46, I think, or 45 or 46. Yep. It's so charming. And this picture, this sketch of Nan too in there is charming. So I think, I think Joan Sue used the same illustrator for you know she had a very good illustrator for several cookbooks if i'm not mistaken at least that one but she was good we okay so nan spent many holidays okay i already said that okay what do nan two loaves of bread a baby a dog an opal cadet and mcdonald's have to do with each other well i'll tell a fun story from my sister which fits the notion that Nan was always a class act. This is what my sister Sharon had to say. I believe it was Thanksgiving around 1976. Dad and mom, Howard and Pat Beilstein, had moved from Riverside, California to El Toro, California. John and I were still living in Riverside. We were asked to pick up Nan and bring her with us to El Toro for Thanksgiving dinner. We had a little 1970 Opal Cadet rally and with the two of us, our one-year-old daughter, Amy, and our dog, Bubba, that's Amy and Bubba in the picture there, it was going to be a tight squeeze. Nan had made a couple of loaves of her delicious cheese bread, affectionately known as American Gothic bread. We decided to stop at McDonald's to get a drink for the approximately hour and a half trip. Nan did not want to leave the bread in the car because she was afraid our dog would eat it. So in we go, John and myself holding Amy and Nan. Nan was all dressed up, a white long sleeved blouse with lacy stand up collar and a black skirt, white hose and white chunky heels. I believe she also had a large brimmed black and white hat on. With her white hair and powdered face, she looked like a beautiful Puritan woman carrying a tray of cheese bread. She was quite a sight to see walking into McDonald's. Anyway, just the, the, uh, the thought of her standing there all dressed up in McDonald's with, with cheese bread was kind of funny. Cheese Next, bread that smelled pretty good. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's, it, it is good. As a young teenager, I collected stamps. I'd buy my packages of stamps at all the stores. I found a package from Sharjah and dependencies in the Middle East with American Gothic. I gave a package to Nan. She was very excited about it. And in fact, she had hoped the US postmaster would honor Grant in the same way. They did posthumously to her ultimately. Nan also gave credit where credit was due. She called the local Riverside paper told the story and mentioned my name as the one who alerted her to the stamp. At 14, I was ecstatic. And it will also mention that she kind of had a bit of serendipity when she went to write to the postmaster in Sharjah, the fellow who was helping her was from that part of the world and translated the address into Arabic for her which was really remarkable. It's mentioned in the article. Um, I do have the article pub posted and I'll tell you where you can see it if you'd like to read it. Next slide. Okay, Iowa in the house. My, fa whoop, yeah. My father was born in Williamsburg, Iowa and lived in Marengo. His Iowa roots were deep. His great grandfather, John Nash even fought in the Civil War for Company B, 28th Iowa Infantry. Due to economic hardship and encouraged by his brother who was in the Navy, his family moved to San Diego in the 1930s. When Frank and Clara joined my grandmother in 1960, my parents became closer to them. Consequently, they grew close to Nan. Our home was always filled with Grant Wood and symbols of Iowa adorned our walls. Even the parakeets kept their eye on Stone City. So, um, you know, you see cooking in the land of, that actually is my Aunt Barbara who gave me in the middle. I had given her a latch hook rug of, you know, American Gothic bears. 
It's my dad with a, a Grant Wood painting behind him. And then the upper left one, I have a, or there's a close-up. So Dorothy, if you could go to the close-up. So on the left are Judy Sutcliffe uh, plates that were done probably in the 70s, I think. I believe there's one of Antioch School. There's different ones that she did. The painting where you see mostly in red was an original Grant Wood um, called Café de Palais. The family ultimately, um, oh yeah, yeah, as I see the comment. Yeah, that's a lot of wine. Yeah, my parents like <laughs> wine. <laughs> um, that Café de Palais was an original that after my parents passed um, was sold by our family. And then over to the right, you can see some decoupage, I think of American Gothic and woman with plants, but this was throughout the house. All, you know, everything Iowa. Next slide. And Debbie, I wanna take you back oh. to the parakeets piece. Okay. Tell the story about a oh, man oh, and the parakeets. Yes. Okay. so. Since I've known Nan since I was just a little kid, and little kids like to have stories repeated ad nauseum. So Nan had told me a story of a pet parakeet that she and Ed had. And this parakeet was quite talented. He had free reign of the house. And she told me that they'd have to cover the butter dish because he would dive bomb the butter. So one day Nan was in her backyard and there was a, a parakeet, not hers, but another one. And so she put the, the cage in the backyard and I guess put some food in and the little parakeet went in. So she was able to catch it. She brought it in the house and her, her parakeet, I believe his name was Petey, he also could talk. So he went to his cage she said he looked down, he did a double take because he saw somebody in his house and he said, that's a pretty bird. So anyway, I think I, I at least 20 times Nan told me, I would have her repeat that story. Tell me about Petey again. So, but those, that is not, those parakeets were, were mine. Those weren't uh, Nan's parakeets right there. Okay. Nan. She was very much like a dear aunt who was wise and warm, who'd been through it all and probably through more than most. I'd like to read you a personal letter from Nan to me that I have never shared publicly. So I'll give you a little bit of background. I was in my 20s when she wrote it. And when you're in your 20s, you go through boyfriend troubles and life is very dramatic. So in retrospect, I think maybe I should thank the fellow who broke my heart at the time because I wouldn't have gotten this cherished letter from Nan if he hadn't. Okay, I'm gonna read this. Dear Debbie, how nice of you to give me the candy and cookies. I haven't opened them yet because if I do, I won't be able to leave them alone. They will be all down the hatch in nothing flat. I didn't rest easy thinking about you last night. I have been in your same situation more than once and I know how it can hurt. I know how it can hurt to realize you are never going to see a sunset again. So I'm going to put my two cents worth of unasked for advice. Don't let this painful experience lick you and try to run away from it. Fight it for all you are worth. Remember what a knockout you were at the company party where you wore the jumpsuit and how your boss complimented you? Well, that worked once, it can work again. Get your face all dolled up. Appear at work, all smiles, no matter how you feel and let them all think you have met a mysterious new man that you can't see very often, just holidays or something like that. Act happy no matter what. And if you do cry, say you are crying because you are so happy. Pretty soon you will find you are really happy and this fellow will come creeping back to you. All he wants is to sleep with this girl anyway. He hasn't any real attachment for her. 
I love you, Debbie. And someday you will meet a real man, but keep up the glamour girl stuff, man. <laughs> okay. It's very cute, cute, uh, cute letter. Nan had countless friends. I don't know anyone who had met Nan express anything other than that she was warm, gracious, classy, kind, sweet, and generous. We would all agree she was that and her brother's greatest fan and defender. Dottie Visker, who's on, who's watching this evening, her nurse in Menlo Park, California wrote, when I was her nurse at La Havre, charge nurse and director of nursing services, I met Mrs. Graham. She was a very lovely lady. She was always dressed nice every day. She was easy to get along with and didn't ask for much. She had lost her eyesight and a lot of her hair. She had a wig that she wore if she had visitors. When I would go in to check on her, she was generally sociable and we would get to talking and many times she would tell me things that would make me laugh. I don't think everybody saw that side of her. She never acted as if she was something special and I was surprised when I found out that she was an American Gothic portrait painted by her brother, Grant Wood. I felt very honored that I got to know her in that way. And it wasn't until much later in my life that I realized just how famous she was. So you can see Dottie with Nan in the upper right portrait. Now I'm gonna talk about, well, you see Wanda Corn. everybody here probably knows who Wanda Corn is and also Park Reinard and Mildred Brown, good friends of Nan's and Park, of course, being Grant's secretary. But the people on the left, that is uh, Dave and Martha Rosen and Nan. And then the bottom middle picture, Martha, Rose, and Nan, and Pauline Cogswell. Pauline and Martha were sisters. And they were also from Iowa, right? Yes, I mean, yes. Almost all these friends are Iowa-based friends. Yes, childhood friends. Um, the, the family name, and I'm, I want to make sure I pronounce it correctly, Von Martinitz. So Martha von Martinitz Rosen was a lifelong friend of Nan's. She and her sister, Pauline von Martinitz Cogswell, took care of Nan and her affairs in her final years. Martha's great niece, Cheryl Petrovich, gave me a handwritten letter Martha had written to be published in a book called Grant Wood and Little Sister Nan by Julie Jensen MacDonald. Martha wrote a lovely piece, which you can find in Julie's book but there's one paragraph that spells out her sense of fun. Nan came often to our home for special occasions. She was a surprise guest at one of our parties. The other guests were art patrons who had been with us on a tour of art museums in France. Nan introduced herself as having the face that appeared in more places and on more objects than any one face in the US. She gave several more clues, but not until she said, the man beside me holds a pitchfork. Did someone guess her identity? Everyone was astonished and couldn't believe that this pleasant, friendly person was a sour-faced, stern-looking spinster in American Gothic, painted by her brother. <clears throat> Next slide. Nan's favorite painting. It wasn't Portrait of Nan. In 1953, Nan wrote the introduction to a cookbook called Cooking in the Land of Corn, published by St. Edward's Parish in Waterloo, Iowa, the church parish of Frank and Clara Wood. Nan wrote, returning home from Europe, Grant's first painting was the one he knew the best and loved the most, our mother. This painting is called Woman with Plant, for it was not intended to be a portrait. Of all the paintings Grant ever did, this painting is both Frank's and my favorite. In this photo is Frank M. Wood standing in front of a gelatone facsimile reproduction of Woman with Plant inscribed to Clara and Frank Wood from their brother Grant. Next slide. Nan's home in Riverside, California. Nan's home was a modest home and not very large. However, when you went inside, it was uniquely Nan's with murals and tassels everywhere. 
As a child, I thought it was luxurious. You can kind of see one of the tassels on the, the lounge or the, the furniture there. Next slide. In 1983, oh, and you can notice here, if you look at the chair, there's some tassels on the chair there too. In 1983, my mother and I went to Nan's house to visit her in Riverside, California. I had a new camera at the time and asked if her if I could take her photo. I said she should hold a prop. No baby chick or plum this time. I took a couple of photos. Here she held a magazine with a parody of American Gothic that had UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher as the farmer and her husband, Sir Dennis Thatcher, as the daughter. Okay. <laughs> ah. When Nan was in Menlo Park, my parents went to visit her. It was near the end of the li her life and she was blind. Nan asked them if I was there with them and my regret to this day was that I was not. Nan was a dear family member who happened to be part of American art history. We were fortunate to have had her in our lives. That's it. Thank you. And Debbie, before you say that's it, there's some, I want you two to talk about her clothes. We'll go back to this one. Oh, yeah. Picture. So Nan, Nan made pretty much all of her own clothes for a lot of years. So that check dress there that she's wearing, she made that. And then that dress she also made. And some of you may recognize this dress because Joan Lifring Zug Bure took some professional, she was a professional photographer, professional photographs of Nan in her home. And there is one that it's of Nan in this dress holding a jug with uh, American Gothic on it. But yeah, she made, she made all of, of uh, pretty much all of her clothes. So we're gonna open it up for questions now. I see a bunch of stuff in the chat. Let's see. Let me go to the top, see if I, oh. They love the doll, okay? Oh, um, someone asked, yeah, the American Gothic cookbook. And then there's also Cooking in the Land of Corn. But Cooking in the Land of Corn does not have the cheese bread in it. That's an older book. It was, it was published in 1953. And you can find them periodically on... Um, eBay or Amazon. Let's see. Yeah, I like that comment. That's a lot of wine, yes. Yes, we had a collection of wine. My parents were, had their cocktails too. Thank you. Thank you about the letter. And Elaine, you're on a oh, mute. It looks like you're going to share something. Oh, I was just going to say about the wine. That makes me laugh because, you know, all I could think of is that I was raised around people who weren't enamored of alcohol at all. And in fact, my grandfather had to sneak out to the machine shed to have a, you know, have a little tip, tip a little whiskey or something. <laughs> um. Uh, Wayne is asking, where is Nan buried? And she is buried in Riverside Cemetery in Anamosa. And I find that kind of an interesting coincidence because L Nan lived many years in Riverside, California. Now, I also find it rather interesting that her husband, Ed, is buried in Riverside, California, yet Nan is buried with her mother and her and uh, two of her brothers, Frank and Clara. I, I'm assuming Frank converted to Roman Catholicism because um, they uh, both were practicing Catholics, and obviously Saint Edward's Parish in Waterloo was a Catholic parish. 
and they are both buried in Holy Cross Cemetery in San Diego, California. So Debbie, another question is how did Nan meet Ed? Oh boy, I think she wrote about that. I don't, I honestly don't remember. I met, I did meet him a couple of times, but you know, I was quite young. Um, but I'm sure that that's written down somewhere, how she met him. I know that once they were married, he got, I believe it was um, tuberculosis. Yes. And, and he, he also was in an accident. Yeah, so he had to live apart from Nan for a while. And that's when she lived at Five Turner Alley with Grant and her mother when he was sick. One of the things too I, I learned was that a lot of people would move to California if they had tuberculosis. They were moving into the Glendale area, um, just east of Pasadena, that area where I know Nan and Ed lived for a while. So sometimes I wonder if that's what kind of brought them out to California was just to, you know, have better health. They also lived in New Mexico. And in fact, her scrapbook was while she was living there. And um, I would have to look, you know, I don't know exactly what the timeline was, but yeah, they lived several places in California actually, but the last place before she moved up North uh, where we got to see her most of the time was when she was in Riverside. And Dottie, I wanted to invite you in to share a few um, memories about Nan, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot. No, I, I was try I was thinking what to say. I'm 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 a little nervous actually. What um, I don't know what you want me to talk about. You can you help me? Absolutely. What, what would you like me to talk about? Tell, tell us a little bit about um, where you worked and how you first met her. And then just, just some of the conversations you had with her as far as just, and what she, remember the day she gave you that postcard or that picture, talk a little bit about that. She said, someday this will be worth something. If you'll talk about that story. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, yeah, well, I was so young. I was just really a couple of years out of nursing school. I'd moved it out from New Jersey and got the job there in Menlo Park, which was this very tiny little boutique uh, nursing home that was uh, very classy, very nice. And we had actually two chefs there that cooked. So it was a really nice place. And uh, so I went there uh, as and got hired as a charge nurse, but I uh, very quickly became assistant director nursing and director nursing, but you still work as a charge nurse. So you're right there with all the patients. and. Um, so Nan's room was kind of catty corner right to where the charge uh, nurse station was right there. So, um, but I know was, she was just so pleasant that I, I popped in there a lot, probably more than anybody else, because uh, I liked her, you know, and uh, you'd go in there and she was just, like you say, uh, first of all, very classy, you know, never complained, never had anything bad to say about anybody or anything. She was just a lovely person, but alone, she was funny. She, she had me laughing all the time. She'd say the funniest things, and I, I wish I could come up with something, but I just don't remember. But I just, um, and then she said to, I remember the first time she showed me above her bed uh, the American Gothic painting, and, you know, and I said, she says, have you ever seen that before? And I said, yeah, that looks really familiar. That's kind of a famous painting. And she said, yeah. And she had this little smirk on her face, you know, and, uh, well, that's me. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and so it was amazing that that was her. And, um, I don't know if I'm going off on a tangent at this point, but we had a thing where she didn't want, like, she got regular calls all the time, people wanting to do um, like news reporters all the time. Well, she absolutely didn't take any calls ever. We were never allowed to let anybody in or get or put the calls through. And I kept asking her about that, making sure that was still what she wanted. And always she said, no, I don't want to do that. So I said, okay, good. Um, but you know, she, 
you're right. She comes off like when she left her room and all, she'd have kind of a stern looking face and she wasn't real, you know, joking with everybody. That wasn't her personality at all. But I, I felt really lucky to get to know her, you know. So, okay. So at the tail end of um, when I was working there, um, oh, nobody's allowed to take pictures of her either. That was like the law, of course, right? And of course, we don't <laughs> take pictures of people anyhow that are patients. But one day she told me, go get, I want you to go buy a disposable camera, bring it in tomorrow because I want you to take a picture. So I went and actually told the administrator what she said. And, you know, they ha we had to make sure it was all okay. And she said, okay, if she gives you permission. So I brought it in and we just took two pictures. That was it. That's all she allowed. <laughs> and um, she says, now tuck that away and don't ever, you know, give it to anybody until I'm gone. But once I'm dead, you could sell it for hopefully a million dollars. <laughs> and I, and I laughed because I thought, what? A million dollars, you know? And because I really didn't understand how famous she was back then. And um, she gave me, so she comes out to the nurse's station with this uh, postcard, which is those real nice ones that she has the American Gothic on the one side. And on the other side, she, what is she, I have it right here. <laughs> Copy of it. I have it actually locked up because so I don't, you know, I figure it's worth a million someday. <laughs> she just wrote to Dottie with love, Nan Wood Graham. And to tell you the truth, when she wrote it, I thought not much said there, you know, but it's heartfelt and I, you know, put it away as a treasure. Then I found out that when she wrote with love, that was a pretty big deal. So I guess she really did like me a lot. So that, that's really nice to know. But she, I don't know. She, I Did I answer that question? You sure <laughs> she did. She was just a lovely woman. And Dottie, is this one of the pictures you I'm honored. Yes, that's um, one of oh. the pictures. Dottie, I just put the one. One of them I'm looking. Oh, you one. put it up? Okay. So yeah, one, I'm yeah. looking sideways at her. And then the other one, she said, well, don't look at me. She said, look at the camera. <laughs> yeah, so that's the one I put <laughs> up. And Dottie, didn't they, I, yeah, think sure. they, I think they made her room, they designated her room like a special memorial room or something. I think they did. I think Cheryl Petrovich did. told me that they okay. you know, was kind of like I, a, I don't remember. And then, and then also, I think, I think that one of the first times you published it was on my page. Somehow we connected, and you and you had published. I put it on my Facebook page. I yeah, I don't know. I really don't even remember how that all happened. I'm, I yeah. think I might have, you know, because my mom did art and then I did some art. And, and of course, I was a nurse. And then I started really getting into art. And once I got really into art, that's when it dawned on me how famous she was. And I thought, wow, you know, that's that's amazing. That, and of course, I was just a young kid. I was only like, what was I 23 24 you know so um and then you know and I never knew back then that I would be uh an artist now too so um anyhow it was pretty interesting I, and I met you and I've met other people now and I've got this whole big part of my life now where um I'm always telling people that I know her <laughs> you know so and I know what okay one of the things she, I was just thinking of something that she said to me that like you were saying and what you were saying that she she just loved anything with her in it she didn't mind that it was kind of like people joking or you know um you know imitating them you know with the pitchfork and all she loved all that stuff she really did so she had a really good sense of humor yeah Let me think what else <laughs> I'm trying to think of something and, to say. And I have to say, um, that's why when I hear a lot of, or I read a lot of things that saying she was stern and hard and like the face in American Gothic, I'm like, that person doesn't know her full in and full out. Um, I wish people would write more, you know, about her whole personality versus just the snippets of personality. 
Yeah, yeah. And she she was saying that to me that um uh she goes, okay, so I was I was kind of cute, she said at that time. You know, she's telling me, you know, I, I was had I had a little makeup on, I did my hair real cute. And I had cute little dresses and all. She said, but you know, I had to look the part. So I pulled my hair back and he wouldn't let me put any makeup on. And, you know, um, didn't she wear her mother's dress? Wasn't, was it her mother's dress or I don't remember. Um, but anyhow, she just said it wasn't really her in, in terms of she was playing a part, you know, for the painting. And, um, and that's what she said later when, you know, Grant, did the other painting of her to make her, you know, to show the, the other side of her. And she liked that. So, yeah. And she adored him. Oh my gosh. She always talked about him. She adored him and he adored her. Yeah. You can tell they really loved each other. That was nice. As I recall, I think it was, it was almost as if Nan as if he hadn't died sometimes. He was very much alive. You know, that was interesting. Yeah, she almost talked about him, uh, just like she was talking about him, like he was right there kind of thing. You're right. He, she did do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and I, that's all I can think of this, um, to say. No, thank you so Unless much. you have a question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johnny, because you're one of the last people, I think, to see Nan alive. She was a wonderful person, yeah. Oh, and I did paint a little cute little painting of that same one. I, I kind of uh, changed it up a little bit, made her put some makeup on her and made her kind of uh, cute. I thought she'd like it because, you know. She said she liked everything that she was in. Didn't mind at all. Like you said, her bedroom, that was a cool picture of all the cutouts on her wall. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Oh, and then I was telling you how the red robin here. She's, oh, yes. The entire wall is a mural. And it, <laughs> so whenever I go in there, I always talk to everybody and tell them that I was her nurse and I knew her, you know. So they're. I don't, like know if, you I don't knew know. Her? I don't know if everybody knows Red, Red Robin is a is a restaurant chain in, in uh, chain in California. So I don't know if that's but they do have a huge um, uh, mural of American Gothic in it. They do, and, and do. Red Robin's yeah. in Iowa too. In Colorado, oh, we had okay. um, American Gothic in ours too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it makes you wonder how do they decide those, cool. make those decisions. And... Well, I think I it's really know. neat to see that picture of of Mildred Brown. Yeah, the, that and now I was kind of hoping that Cheryl Petrovich would be on the call tonight. I had sent her an invitation, and that she has given me images of and also some photographs personally from um from nan and and mildred and park that obviously that was at some something for nan i don't know if that was at when they had her no that would not have been in in february i don't think if it was in iowa that would have been that would have been too cold but yeah, that's from Cheryl. Unfortunately, she's not on the call to explain exactly where that was. Uh, the Mildred Brown picture? Uh -huh. that's, that's Stone City. Oh, so okay. That's the barn behind there. So that's on the um, Green Mansion estate. Do you suppose it looks like one of the festivals? Early it does. It, early yeah, early. there's a lot of people there. It looks like it. And and Park would come back. And I, Paul, you probably know this too, and that kind of a circle of friends of Grant would always come back for the um, Grant Wood Art Festival. And so all these friends are close circle of, you know, people who really knew him and really supported him came back and connected at the Stone City Art Festivals. Yeah, so that's Stone City. 
I think, you know, my earliest um, memory of her is she was our first Grand Marshal when we had our first um, Grant Wood days in Anamosa, Iowa. Um, I just remember as a child, too, seeing her on the back of the um, kind of a convertible, you know, waving at everybody. And we'd be like, who is that? You know, I mean, I was like you, Debbie. I was very young, um, not really understanding. And to Dottie's point, too, who is this woman? We knew she was related to Grant Wood. But once again, we said, that's just some local painter, right? <laughs> we had no idea. But that's when we would see her. And um, and to think she came all the way back from California and then she took these trinkets back to you. It's yeah. just such a cool connection. Well, and to your point earlier, the women around there really did uh, sew lots of doll clothes. Yes. Oh, my goodness. It was a thing. It was a thing. And that's why I wondered if this one was made by somebody locally. And I'm getting back there slow, but sure. Yeah. yeah. Because they would make these beautiful, um, there was often a little bit taller dolls, almost as tall as like a Barbie. They would make these incredible dresses to show the centennial of the town and the dresses would look like that time period. And like Elaine said, that was a big deal back then. So Debbie, when you don't want that doll any longer, you know, you just need to let those of us from Iowa know and um, put it up for a bidding war. Oh my gosh, 1972, how many years ago is that? Oh my gosh. That's what, 60 years? Am is I that what it says no. on it is 72 or is it 73? Or 73, no, you're right, I'm looking. So that would have been the very first art festival in Animosa. Okay, so I can't count in my head, how many years is that? Boy, it's almost 50, a what, 60? 51, no. No, it's almost 50, yeah. yeah. 50, 50. Thank thanks you, Barbara. Barbara. You got and did you got you your calculator? I would have had to. <laughs> but you know, one of the things we've talked about a little bit is how you know Grant struggled at the University of Iowa toward the end of his career, and then died in 1942. And when you think of the stories about how they wrote him out of the art history books, um, I think back on Animosa having the Grant Wood festivals um, starting in '73. Um, you know, that was one of the things that kept his legacy going. I'm so glad that people, you know, once again found their love for Grant Wood, but I, I love the fact that Iowa kept it going when it could have been kind of erased from existence in a lot of ways. And that's what I appreciate about his legacy and Nan's is that um, they're such incredible people that a legacy like that can never be stopped. It can never, it will always live on. And I think that's what I love about where we're at today is that, um, so many people have made it possible for Grant to be remembered and for Nan to be remembered and all the folks that, you know, they call friends and Iowans. I think that's pretty special. Dorothy, um, someone asked me about Mildred Brown and her relationship with Nan. I know that they were good friends, but you from Anamosa would know, wasn't, wasn't Mildred like the wife of a doctor, an established doctor in Anamosa, and yeah, she a little museum, Nan's museum there, and you guys can talk about that better than I can. Well, you've got some of that story too, which I love. So you're right, Mildred um, was part of the Paint and Palette Club, which is a local Anamosa club that people painted, and um, and so of course they would sell their paintings or hang them around town, and yes, every time. I was told, and correct me if someone's heard differently, but when Nan would come back for the Grant Wood Art Festival, especially in those early years, she would stay with Mildred. Yeah, so, and Mildred too, um, I'm really excited. I recently bought um, one of her paintings. Someone in Anamosa was getting rid of some of Mildred's paintings and she had painted one of the Grant Wood Schoolhouse. Um, so I have that hanging in my house. So it's, it was great when you brought this picture up of Mildred. Um, yeah, just someone Animosa knew very well. And like Debbie said, Debbie, you want to talk a little bit about her museum? Because I think you know about that a little bit better than us. Well, what I know about it basically is that it was in the building where her husband had his doctor's office and I think it closed, but everything that 
was on display, including Nan's clothes, even that checkered dress, um, the tablecloth from, um, from uh, what's the, what's the mirror or the painting? Dinner, dinner for Threshers. Thank you, thank you, Paul. I knew you'd help me. Uh, that was there, all kinds of um, memorabilia. And I have photo, Cheryl Petrovich, again, um, related to Friends of Nan's, gave me a set of photos that her aunt and her son had gone back to Iowa and taken a bunch of photographs of the museum that Mildred had. And um, it, was, it was very homespun, I would say. It was really cute, but very important. It had, it had some items from, the, uh, from Stone City, um, uh, the time when, when Grant had the festival there in Stone City. So, but it, I guess it closed a number of years ago and I know a group of, of Iowans wanted to go look at everything and I don't know if they got to see, Elaine, didn't you get to see some, didn't you guys go out there to see the stuff or it was still closed up yeah, or? It was still, yeah, we weren't able to, to yeah, make that happen. Um, but it seems like I've got some recent pictures of some things that were just left there. Um, I, I think Randy forwarded those to me, Dorothy. Okay. Um, uh, but, but I mean, there's really not much left there. Right. I think that I, that I can tell, but. Well, I knew Mildred and I was in the museum with her and she pointed to two things that I thought held exceptional interest. One is, as Debbie said, she pointed to the checkered tablecloth and she said, this is the one that Grant used as a model um, when he was doing dinner for threshers. And the other thing she pointed to, and I know I've told many of you this, this item that I, I think is a very valuable item, uh, was on one of the walls, uh, was the diagram of the four colored lithographs with Grant Wood's writing saying, color this green, color this red, uh, color this yellow, that he had sent out to California uh, for Nan and her husband to do the coloring of those lithographs. Now, I know I saw that, um, but what became of it, I don't know. But I'd certainly hope that some museum eventually uh, would get it because I, I think it's it was really, in my mind, very valuable. You know, uh, I'm, I don't know when she, I don't know when she put that little museum together, but it seems to me that I'm wondering if in the early 80s, so my great uncle passed away in 1982. I remember visiting her in her home in 83. I'm not sure when exactly she moved up north but I'm sure a lot of the items, maybe um, Pauline and Martha helped her ship a bunch of stuff out to, out to Mildred to put in the museum. I don't know when that museum started. I don't know. I would guess about the time that Dr. Brown died or shortly after Dr. Brown's death, since she Actually, used his. He was succeeded in town by uh, Dr. Aaron Randolph and he oh. was in that building for a while. And then, <clears throat> so it would have been after um, Dr. Randolph left that building, which I, it's been too long for me to guess the date. I just thought it was also interesting that she sent, or Mildred ended up with a lot of Nan's clothes and she put them on mannequins in the, in the little museum that she had. I would have loved to have gone there. Well, my goodness, this has just been, can you believe it? It's eight o'clock already. Oh my goodness. So um, we can linger for just a second more. If folks got any more last second thoughts, comments, questions, random well, musings. <laughs> if you could bring up uh, the painting again, there's a few things I, I could point out on it. 
You bet. Just stories, but uh, we might enjoy them. Let's see, there we go. At the very, the first, yeah, there you go. Um, well, historians have looked at this, I, I read, and they pointed out some things that I kind of found to be of interest, um, art historians. Um, one thing is that they talked about the bat or crows that are on the blouse. Some call them bats and some call them crows. And some have wondered whether this is uh, th the way Grant sometimes would spoof uh, a painting in some way. Um, and maybe he was trying to say that she was really something to crow about. I don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, they also, many historians say the chick and the plum are folk motifs or symbols of fertility. And finally, and I've pointed this out before, uh, the brass um, fixture that's holding the curtain back seems to have on it the Star of David, which would be symbolic perhaps of Grant's time in Europe and the growing anti-Semitism that he saw there. Um, also the blouse itself, uh, some people have written that uh, Grant wanted something with polka, polka dots on it. And so he used a biscuit cutter to slice rounds from a potato and then ink them and stamp them on the blouse. Now, whether that's true, I'm not sure. Um, but I just would point out a few of those things. Uh, Nan herself said that, um, some, some, some have said that that chick had been an Easter gift, but it really wasn't true because they were Quakers and they didn't go in for Easter candy or chickens or eggs and rabbits. Uh, but Nan had actually bought uh, two of them because they were cute at a, at a store. Um, one died and she was showing the other one to Grant and um, she was eating a plum from the kitchen at the same time and Grant said, hold it, that's how I'm going to paint you. And the chick uh, would repeat the yellow of her hair and the plum would repeat the color of the background of that curtain. Um, he took a lot of time doing the painting and during the time the chicken grew up um, and uh, Nan said it was spoiled and was up all hours of the night. It roosted on Nan's shoulder and tug, would tug at her hair. And there was a sponge rubber cigarette and Grant would toss it to the chicken and it would run around the room thinking it had a worm. And this got a laugh, but one day it swallowed it whole but didn't die from it. And later he gave it to one, the chick to one of David Turner's employees who raised chickens. And that employer later said that this chick became the best mother hen he ever had. Oh. So just a few stories uh, relating to the portrait. And Paul, I'm gonna to add to that chicken that lived that they evidently gave away. I had read that, um, that chicken, you know, stayed up all hours of the night with Grant while he was painting and kind of being fussy. And so Grant put the chicken in a pail and put a book over the pail. Well, when they took the book off the next morning, that little chick had fainted, didn't have enough air. And evidently they spent a long time trying to get that chicken to come to, <laughs> which they did. Um, but yeah, that little chicken became a household um, pet for sure. <laughs> Well, and, and, and chickens are a motif, you know, and the whole pantheon of Grant Wood's work. So <laughs> recurring theme, so that's neat. Well, folks, all good things must come to an end, they say. I mean, unfortunately, but um, look forward to seeing a lot of you, I hope all of you next week when we have a chance to share readings and inspirations and more conversation, of course, that that sparks in its own unique way. Um, and so I just can't wait to hear what else folks have and have to offer for next, uh, for next uh, Monday for our reading session. So uh, keep, keep the love alive and have a wonderful week, everybody. Thank you.